He's a Romanian, and his name is Relu Constantin. You will see his picture in just a moment. Earlier this year, I read a picture about, I read a story about him and saw his picture. He had not been home for almost 20 years. His family had not heard from him in all that time, and he had not sent back any money. All efforts to locate him in Turkey, where he had gone for work, had been fruitless. Under the circumstances, and there were some odd circumstances, it seemed entirely reasonable that his estranged wife asked a Romanian court to declare him legally dead. And then, 2016, a death certificate was issued. The only problem was, as you can see from the picture, he was very much alive. And that was just the beginning of his troubles. As he discovered that when he finally returned home in the January of this year, in a plot twist that would come out of a Kafka novel, he found that they, in fact, had issued his death certificate and that left him in legal limbo about his life and the administration of his desk. And he said this, at the airport in Bucharest, I was surrounded by custom officers. They said you were dead. He recalled with disbelief. I thought they were joking. I was the only one who didn't know. The people who escorted me off the plane knew everything and everyone was different. And now they knew that I was dead except me. <laughs> oh boy, isn't the world's life, the, the world and the life that we live weird? But it caused me to think when is someone dead? Because of the medical life support systems that we now have in place, the cessation of a heartbeat and a breathing is sometimes not sufficient to definitely tell whether or not a person is dead. Doctors sometimes tell us that in, we, as we're in the waiting room that their loved one is dead, that there's been a pronouncement over them, but it's always important that the correct pronouncement is made because of these systems that we now have in place. The things can change. As a matter of fact, they tell us now that they actually have to stop your heart and start it again in certain heart procedures. Therefore, in cases when a person is sustained by life support, they are believed otherwise dead. There is now a standard that's been adopted across our country, and the patient is dead only when they are no longer functioning brain activity. And that's determined in two ways. First, a detailed process that ascertains that a person can no longer hear a voice, uh, feel a touch, or have a pain, or other stimuli. And the other thing is confirming that the brain stem no longer works to regulate the person's breathing. And so when the person is removed from a ventilator, they can no longer breathe on their own. I would love to tell you I've never seen that happen. But I have. I've been in the room more times than I would want to remember. When the ventilator has been taken off, the family typically calls a pastor or someone to come and pray over the, the person there, and it's usually not long after the ventilator is unhooked that the person dies. I have recently seen that, and I will tell you it is to this day the most wretched thing I've ever gone through. Wretched not in the sense that uh, I don't have a, a, a great trust in uh, the afterlife. Wretched in the sense that I don't want those folks to die. In one case recently, it was devastating to me as I left that hospital that night. Dr. Frank, Dr. Corey Franklin, he is the director of an intensive care unit in Cook County of Chicago. He puts it like this, after having served 20 years in the medical intensive care, he says it, no patient with a proper diagnosis of brain death ever has recovered to come off life support, even with life support, no one has survived for a prolonged period, and when life support is withdrawn, the heart invariably stops within minutes. And so it has put my, my brain to thinking this week, while physical death is not our subject, we have begun with the matter of setting standards for which death occurs. I want us to think about what it means for us to die. In particular, I want that applied to our faith experience, because Lord knows that some of us have a faith experience that maybe is dated or is on life support. It is not breathing fully the life that you and I expected. 
And so we are going to walk our way around the theme that we find in verse 17. So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. You got your Bible and follow along. We're going to read chapter 2, verses 1 through 17. New International Version is what I'm reading from. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a person comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If he shows special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there, sit on the floor by your feet, by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom? He promised those who love him, but you have dishonored the poor. It is not the rich who are exploiting you. Are they not the ones who are dragging you into courts? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom we belong? And if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you love, if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. And if you do not commit adultery and do not commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers and sisters? If someone claims to have faith but has no deeds, can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. And if one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed but does nothing about their physical needs. What good is it? The same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. So what is, uh, when is faith dead? If you got your folder and want to follow along, let's find our way there. If I could put one sentence under those 17 verses, it would go something like this. Acts of favoritism and partiality that result in dishonoring the poor within a Christian context. Why do you think the poor are important to those of us who are Christians? Because over and over again, scriptures talk to us about the poor. And if you've been around poor folks, and I would suggest you do that, whether you do it by choice, and I can help you with that if you're not around some poor folks, but there is something about poor folks. They have a dependency on life that's different than ours. We cover all of our bases and there's a sense of security in doing all that. But the truly poor, the truly poor do not have that. I don't know if you've seen the recent controversy with the GoFundMe uh, homeless man. You're going to see his picture there. A GoFundMe account, for those who are not aware, is simply an account now that you can give to for different causes where you give money and the, the organization uh, is ensured that the, the, the money will go for the right purposes. Well, the homeless man there on the left, as I'm looking at the picture, the bearded one, is the man that uh, helped the lady over there on the right. She had a flat tire several months ago, and he was a homeless man at SAR, and he took his last $20 and got her gasoline. Well, she was so blown away by that that he would take, do that and help her that she and her boyfriend, that they're not married, but her boyfriend, they went on Facebook and started talking about it, and they put together a GoFundMe page. Anybody guess how much money's been given to it? $403,000. And guess what? From all indications, the man and the woman in the picture are spending the money. Now, there is some real mystery still surrounding it. I did more reading than I needed to this week. But they have admitted no wrong, and they said they simply stopped letting him spend the money because he was spending it for the wrong thing. 
Now let me just tell you, if I made the folks who come into my office and who I see regularly stop doing what I know is wrong, I wouldn't be helping anybody. Because i got to tell you, I, I'm a good judge. I mean, I, I like to judge. Anybody here not like to judge? <laughs> we can make choices. I mean, you know, they come in with a cell phone and the smell of cigarettes and they need money for food. You think I want to go, sure I do. But do I? No, none of you have had to get me out of jail yet. So they have denied, they just said, we, we're, we don't need to give him money for anything that's bad. But they happen to have a new BMW parked in their car lot. That has been possessed, by the way. Repossessed. I say all that to say, you and I have to treat needs and, and must treat people fairly. No matter what economic setting they find themselves because failure to keep the whole law instead of choosing bits and pieces. And so you've got all these scriptures in here. Love your neighbor as yourself, showing no mercy, paying the lip service to one's faith and not expressing that faith. And faith by itself has, is dead if it has no works. So how do we prove that? How do we prove that? Well, a faith that is no longer moving. That would be fair to me. No longer moving. No longer moving. Is, is the, to me the exact phrase, because unlike when a person physically dies, no more, no longer communicates, they no longer move. People with a dead faith, more often than not, keep talking, but they don't do any moving. They are kind of dead. Like what the late Ethel Barrett, who was uh, well known for her skill in telling Bible stories for kids, she said it this way, she says, you have a tongue in your head and two tongues in your shoes. And no matter what the tongue in your head is saying, the tongues in your shoes will tell you what you're doing and where you are going. The awful truth is that the tongues in your shoes have the last word. And they do. Psychologist Alfred Alder said, Trust only movement. Life happens at the level of events, not words. Trust movement. I tried to think of two moments in my life where I needed to move. I will give them to you. One of them, I was a seminary student. I came home, worked for the summer. Many of you know that story. I went through an experience where I suffered a gunshot wound and uh, my right lung was collapsed. And for seven days, six days, it set on, uh, it was not going to expand. And, Finally, the doctor came in, and they did a little analysis, and they said, we've got to put a chest tube in him. And I said, sounds good to me. I was not the good thing to say if you've ever had a chest tube. And so the lung was expanded again, and I remembered breathing deeply that night as I lay in the bed. The first thing I wanted to do when I got out of the hospital was move. This side of my body was still numb quite a bit. And I remember wanting my body just to move. And when I began to move enough to walk, and then when I began to walk enough to run, I began to breathe deeply enough. There was something incredibly powerful about that. On a much smaller scale, later I had a hip put in my left side. And I remember the numbness of that part of my body, and even to this day, that strange not human piece of metal that's in my left hip and how it feels awkward sometimes when I stretch but the power of being able to allow me to move some of you are getting ready to go through surgeries with your knees and your whatever it might be and there's that the desire is this I want to move better life at its best is movement and so it is with Christian faith no matter what you've known or believed through the years, it is keeping your faith moving. And that faith needs to move in a direction toward people, in a direction toward assisting, in a direction toward that Friday night that we go feed the homeless. There's something unbelievably powerful about just being there. There is movement. But we need to deal with one little theological whim here and that is there's this discrepancy that people often talk between James and Paul 
Let's do that very, very quickly. Some tend to go off on a tangent and say, if you eat Paul, he doesn't say that. That Paul says, you know, this works thing is not nearly as important as James. Well, let me give you real quickly just the differentiation. In Romans, Paul says, for we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works. And in Galatians, he said, and now we have come to believe in Christ so that we might be justified by faith in Christ, not by doing works of the law because one has been justified by the works. Now, what Paul was talking about, he was referencing us before we came out of the darkness of sin in our lives, before we had made a movement toward God. And he was saying there is absolutely nothing you can do to move out of that darkness except receive through faith, the grace of God. But once you get through that darkness in the light, there is an expectation that your life will, by its very supernatural, renewed nature, serve, give, do works. And so let's make sure we understand that. So there is a moving, and then there is a working faith. There's a working faith. Verses 15 and 16. If a brother or a sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? That's lip service. Let me make a distinction here, and that is that uh, if you've seen me much around the church, particularly on Sundays with homeless folks or needy folks that tend to show up on Sunday, you've noticed that I have a message for them. We, do, we worship on Sunday. If you want to talk to us the other days of the week about those other things. Now, I know there are certain days and there are certain situations that they can't change, and then I will lean into that and try my best to help. I came in this morning, and uh, there was a message on my phone machine, and it was a person asking for me to help them again uh, and this time they said with work but I will just tell you of the uh, almost nine years I've been your pastor I've probably assisted this particular couple more than any other couple and their life situation has not changed I've given them every chance to to get it you know other situations but they just live in that world they live in that world of need all the time Jesus knew about that he knew that the poor would always be with us he knew that but he did not use that as an excuse to ignore them so the best thing to handle all of this is the final point and that is this the resurrection of faith there is a difference between recitation being recitated resuscitated and between being resurrected one is you're unconscious and you're brought to consciousness the other one is you are dead and you come to life. And that, my friends, is miraculous. Lee Strobel has a new book out. Some of you have read it. Matter of fact, one of you gave me a copy of it. What you don't realize is I don't read real books anymore. Everything has to be on a, on a page that I scan. And I, who would, I'd never have thought I would do that. I used to love to feel the book and to breathe it. And now I realize that I have to carry my books if I buy them. And I don't want to do that anymore. Anyway, he's given me a book and I've been perusing it. And one of the stories in Lee Strobel's book, who I've met, by the way, he's quite, the, quite a guy. He, he, was, an, he was an atheist, uh, a writer for the Chicago Tribune, and uh, came to an incredibly profound faith experience. But in the book, it tells about a lady by the name of Mar uh, Barbara Snyder. Barbara was, had been to the Mayo Clinic. She had multiple sclerosis. She was in incredibly bad uh, health. And so after years of pain and operations, finally she had succumbed and they, they had moved in with hospice with a no res re resuscitation um, plea for them. And she was uh, near, by now nearly blind. She was, blo uh, her body had was curled up. And by now she had a throat, in, she had a tube in her throat and a tube in her stomach. But somebody called in to the Moody Bible radio show and said, I want to put her on the prayer list. If you 
have read his book, you hear the story that he says. Later, a couple days later, her legs began to straighten out. Not only did they begin to straighten out, they began to fill out. (laughs) She pulled her tubes out. And she could see. 31 years later now, she tells that story. I don't know about you, but uh, give me some of that (laughs) Kool-Aid. Give me some of that miracle. Do I believe that? Absolutely. Would I like to snap my finger and see more of that? Absolutely. I've got two folk right now where hospice has been brought in. And I would jump to joy. I would do whatever I needed to do if I could call upon the healing for these two people. Interestingly, Lee Strobel did an uh, uh, an interview. He did a poll, and only about 15% of the people that he polled said they did not believe in miracles. So we believe in them. How about having one? How about having a life of faith and fullness where you live on the edge of the miraculous? We had a young boy who has been under the care of cardiologists all of his life, little Braden. You see him over here. The, um, Scott and his family's out of town this week, but he sits over here with his mama. And it, did you see the prayer list? He had always, he's been under the care of a cardiologist since the day he was born. And he's 14, 15, and the doctor cleared him this week. Well, that's not a miracle, is it? Of course it is. <laughs> I want my faith to be on the edge of miraculous. I've been studying trees a little bit lately. Don't let my wife know that because she thinks I might go out in the yard and do something, but but we have a, a, a fellow that's coming by to, to trim our trees. Now, in our old yard, before we moved, we had so much grass, I never saw the trees. You know, we were just cleaning the grass all the time. And here, we don't have near as much grass, so I have to notice the trees. And we got beautiful trees. We got big, beautiful trees. So I found out the other day, you have to trim trees. Did you know that? You have to trim trees. The problem is, these are about 40 foot tall. So I've got my tree trimmer coming by tomorrow, and I'm going to stand there and watch him. But I've been reading about trees. They're some of the most powerful. I mean, plants by themselves, you could, they, get, they do so well with life. They just, it's hard to kill them. I won't bore you with all that I've been reading about them. But Paul said, in agreement with James, we are what God has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Have you ever pulled out a $20 bill or something and a person look at it and they take that little pencil up there and rub across it? You ever done it? See them do that? That little pen across there? They think your, your money might be counterfeit. That's why they do that. Do you know how they train people who are in the business of recognizing counterfeit money. You know how they train them? They train them with a little stick that runs around and uh, and runs. No, they don't. That's not how they train them. A person who's trained to pick out counterfeit, he doesn't know how the counterfeit looks. He just knows how the real deal looks. They train them to know what the real deal looks like. I'll be honest with you. I know what the real deal of a Christian looks like. They love and they serve. They love and they serve. They have movement in their faith. They have a working faith and they have a resurrected miraculous faith. Let's pray together.